everyone. Good, good morning. I'm Hannah Moreta. I'm a PGY4. Um, and my lecture is called A Dreaded Ethical Lump, Resource Allocation. And this is part of the Social Ethical Palliative EM Lecture Series. And I want to uh, thank the team um, for helping me with this, election, this lecture. It includes Dr. Christoph, Raboyo, Berlin, Sim, Warshaw, and Kendall. Okay, so I want to just uh, start off with a hypothetical case. Your NCCT and EMS rolls in with this patient. They're hypoxic, altered, uh, severe respiratory distress. You're getting ready, you're anticipating intubation, getting ready to resuscitate this patient when EMS rolls in with this patient. Same thing, now you're trying to figure out how you're gonna allocate your time and resources in regards to the nursing staff, uh, you and your, uh, your, you know, either your junior or senior resident attending. When e the EMS brings in this third patient. And um, first of all, thank you for everyone that uh, filled out the survey. Um, and so for everyone that filled out the survey, I'm sure you're kind of expecting me to then say, there's one ventilator. Um, so, you know, I, I don't really need to go too, too much in depth with just kind of uh, talking about like the overwhelming uh, situation uh, that hit us in March and April. Um, our healthcare system was clearly overwhelmed by COVID. Um, we were witness to suffering, um, you know, daily, uh, making, you know, we, we generally do make difficult decision, decisions and, and witness suffering um, on a day-to-day -day basis, but um, this definitely amplified it. Uh, we made decisions regarding balancing saving lives and protecting ourselves and coworkers. Um, we sent page, we sent patients home that, home that we would never have considered to send home uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, we changed our threshold for resuscitation, and we did you know we never ran out of ventilators, but we did make decisions um, about allocation of scarce resources. So this is uh, uh, the result of the, um, two of the survey questions I asked, I wanted to know um, how often you guys are making ethical decisions on distribution of scarce life-saving resources, uh, both pre-COVID and post-COVID. Um, so, you know, we, we did sometimes, uh, you know, most of us rarely made ethical decisions on uh, distribution of scarce life-saving resources prior to COVID. Um, and that might have to do with, um, you know, maybe some people were thinking more about patient economy, weighing benefits and risks, um, and others were thinking about, you know, the times where there's one, one more CCT room available, um, or one where we're short on staffing. Um, clearly, during the COVID pandemic, um, you know, many more of us were making these types of difficult ethical decisions. So this is what I'm gonna discuss. Um, I'm gonna be discussing ethical princi principles for resource allocation, the ex existing guidelines for allocation of ventilators, um, a quick ethical framework for rapid decision making in the emergency department, um, and the clash between society's ethical principles and reality. So these are the fundamental ethical principles uh, that we're all familiar with, respect for autonomy, non-maleficence, justice, and beneficence. Um, so just to quickly go over them, respect for autonomy, uh, it recognizes patients as rational agents that should be able to make informed and voluntary decisions. Uh, so that, you know, is the idea of Patients having the ability to, to leave, uh, refuse management, inform consent, DNR, DNI decisions. Um, then the, the idea of non maleficence is the you know, classic do no harm, and that is uh, whether do no harm by either committing or omitting an action. Um, justice, simply put, fairness, um, which, you know, can mean equal treatment to all, but it might not be that simple because you could think about equal treatment to all based on based on need, uh, equal treatment to all based on merit or contribution, or just kind of a blanket statement of um, equal treatment to all regardless of those factors. And then bene beneficence, our duty to help as physicians. Um, and just having these ethical principles just kind of, uh, this doesn't mean that our actions always follow all four principles. Um, we're constantly weighing, uh, you know, risks versus benefits, um, uh, balancing beneficence over patient autonomy. Um, and so there are several, you know, examples I'm sure we could all think of where, where our ethical decisions, you know, uh, these principles clash. And a classic example of that would be, you know, um, deciding what to do when a Jehovah Witness um, refuses a blood transfusion, um, in which case we would, you know, we do respect patient autonomy 
Whereas in a in the case where a patient um, you know wants to commit suicide, uh, we are more on the paternalistic side of uh, putting beneficence over patient autonomy. All right, so during a pandemic, um, when resources are scarce, it doesn't mean that uh, those fundamental ethical principles no longer apply, uh, but there definitely is a shift from thinking from primarily focused on patient, focused, focused on patient autonomy um, and harms versus benefits to focusing on how we can maximize benefit um, and, and justice. And the reason we do that is because, you know, when, when, it, when there's scarcity, we need to, to uh, move from thinking about individual patients to thinking about many patients, whether that's, you know, the, the patients in our emergency department or from a society public health standpoint where we're thinking about you know, the greater good for, for everyone. Um, I wanted to uh, just kind of go over some of the scarce life-saving resources. So can, can you give me a few examples of some, some human resources that might, that were scarce um, in our hospital or, or, you know, maybe scarce? Respiratory. RT. Respiratory techs. Uh, dialysis machines. Dialysis nurses. Dialysis nurses. Someone said oxygen, peep valves, uh, and dialysis nurses. Yeah. Great. Great. So yeah, human resources, that's like us, um, ICU physicians, um, our, our ICU and emergency nurses. Um, and we know that we were short of, short of uh, you know, nurses and physicians that were trained to deal with critically ill patients. Uh, materials that are short, so, you know, that's infrastructure related. Um, and then, you know, uh, we did run out of BiPAP machines, um, oxygen takes for sure, dialysis catheters, and so on, definitely PPE. <laughs> and ECMO is, is always a, a, a scarce resource. Okay, so um, what did we do in the face of the scarcity? So New York City um, definitely responded by increasing capacity. At baseline, New York City Health and Hospitals has the capacity to um, to care for 300 ICU patients, um, and during the surge, they were caring for a thousand ICU patients. So, how did how was that accomplished? Um, health and hospitals uh, increased ICU capability by creating open ICUs. So, those were an ambulatory surgery units. Um, PACUs, our ambulatory surgery unit had a, it was an open ICU with 24 ICU beds. We brought in physicians and nurses. Uh, many of them were not critically uh, care trained. We brought up old stretchers and OT2 tanks um, that were, you know, had been in storage for decades. Um, another thing was, you know, innovation. When you run out of BiPAP machines, is there another way to provide to pro provide PEEP to patients? Um, and then even thinking, you know, we didn't get to this point, but if we really ran out of ventilators, would it even be a possibility to put multiple patients on one vent? Um, and just like a shout out to the people at, at this residency that are working, um, at some of our attendings and residents are actually working on um, trying to figure out if that's a safe thing to do, to put um, four patients for one, one event. Um, and so, so, you know, we definitely increased capacity across the university. is tremendous, but the, the downside of increasing capacity uh, concern with it is, is uh, the degree to which quality goes down. Um, so I want to discuss some other options about what to do when um, in the face of scarcity. And one is, is you know, just clinic, clinical physician uh, decisions, you know, at the bedside deciding, you know, what, which um, based on what the patient looks like in terms of like their clinical status, um, which, which patients should get these resources. Um, one option um, is kind of like the go with the flow option, first come, first serve. Um, so this may seem, you know, fair, um, a fair way to distribute resources um, because you're not really choosing who gets the resources, just whoever shows up first. You know, there's two patients in your ED requiring a ventilator. Um, you give it to the patient that arrived first. Um, but the problem with this is that um, it might not be equitable. You know, there's patients that arrive to the ED later than other patients, and um, there's factors that, you know, would contribute to why that is. Um, also, it doesn't really maximize any benefits. We don't, can't really and increase the life saved by, by using this method. The other, the other um, possibility is randomization, just like a coin toss. So, uh, a, a coin toss. Um, so, you know, two patients in the ED, which one gets a ventilator, uh, just random allocation. And that, again, it's, it's, it seems fair, but um, does not give us the ability to maximize benefits. And the third criteria, which is, or the third option, uh, which many of you, you know, based off the survey recognizes is, is the 
best option to maximize benefits uh, would be to have some kind of triage criteria. We've been doing, triage has been an accepted way of allocating scarce resources um, for a long time. Uh, an example of this is an organ transplant, you know, where organs are, uh, donated organs are scarce. Um, and the idea of triage is just basically to kind of select out patients that would, that are unlikely to benefit from our resource, either they would do fine uh, without it, or most likely to do fine without it, or they would, whether they have the resource or not, um, most likely not too well. Um, so just quickly thinking about maximizing benefit, we can think about this in a few ways. We could think about life saved, um, life years saved, or quality adjusted life years. Um, and generally, um, the, the most uh, standard ways of, of doing this would be life saved and year saved. Um, and generally, to, to do this, you would uh, most guidelines um, are, are focused on prognosis, and that kind of depends on whether it's short term or long term prognosis. Um, so another thing, so you know, maximizing benefit, you always have to keep it in balance with um, with justice. So um, as I mentioned, justice is kind of this idea of, of fairness. Um, so uh, the principle of justice is the idea that all patients with a comparable prognosis should have equal access to necessary medical care. Um, the issue is what do you do with patients when patients have the same prognosis? Um, and I'll be discussing this a little bit more. Um, so in terms of, uh, there, are so, there are a couple of um, major categories uh, that really kind of create tension here. So uh, what to do about age, comorbidities, um, and, and also uh, should we be treating, giving treatment priority to, to healthcare workers? Um, so I sent, sent this um, question out to everybody. Um, I, I asked, you know, I just kind of, I, did, I looked at a lot of um, I, any clinical information. Basically, I just asked if you have a 35 year old um, and an and a 80 year old, and there's only one ventilator, uh, who would you decide? Um, and then I made the, the, that question even more complicated by narrowing um, that, that, that distinction. Um, I just want to stop for a moment and just kind of get an idea to, if anyone has any like just general thoughts about answering that question, how it made them feel. I mean, it was just clicking. Yeah. I think it was easy because there's no other ancillary information. You know, like a, a lot of times we have our like more destitute 45 year old. You know, there's a lot that goes into it. Like we have a diabetic hypertensive. I mean, some of our diabetic hypertensives with end state of disease are 45. And you can juxtapose that with one of our healthy 60 year olds. That would be a different conversation. You just ask this by age. So. Right, right. Um, tough question for somebody in their sixties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's it's a difficult question, and and the you know what? How do we manage? You know, we're, we're you know we shouldn't be discriminating um, on on age or disability. That's I mean that's in federal law. Um, but what do you do when when age is related to the prognosis um, of the disease, and, and we're thinking about maximizing benefit? It's complicated. Um, and same with same with comorbidities. Um, so you know, I, this is basically kind of you know, I was just kind of getting across. We all know hypertension, diabetes, and obesity are, are uh, related to worse outcomes with COVID. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, it's one of the I, I asked for some comments at the end, and somebody um, kind of uh, really said it really well. And actually, shoot, I thought I put it in. Um, oh yeah, yeah. So this is I'm just gonna read off this quote, uh, so thanks to whoever wrote this in. Um, this is an example of rather a thought, any formal guidelines for rationing care based on past medical history, risks doubling down on systematic inequalities that produce these conditions in patients. Um, and yeah, and this is something that is addressed in, you know, when uh, in, in like the ethical dis decision-making of coming up with these guidelines is like, how do we avoid this like double disadvantage? Um, we know which, you know, there are groups of patients that are more likely to get COVID and more likely to die from COVID. How do we add another another disadvantage to that, or how do we avoid adding a disadvantage, another disadvantage? Okay, and then this is a big question that comes up, with, uh, you know, in the decision making for creating guidelines um, for sure of, uh, of scarce resources. For scarce resources, um, is you know the idea of reciprocity and instrumental value. Um, so, should we be giving treatment priority to healthcare providers? Um, most, uh, based on the survey, most of us think yes. Um, and, um, you know, there's, there's two ways to look at this retrospectively. Should we be rewarding people for the risk that they took um, and, and for the lives that they, 
you know, they saved. Um, and also thinking prospectively, you know, this is this is a way of maximizing benefit by saving the letter to save others. Um, but of course, there is, you know, it introduces it, it introduces bias. So this isn't universally accepted in, in guidelines. All right, so I'm going to go into the ventilator allocation guidelines. Um, so there were ventilator allocation guidelines pre-COVID, um, and many, many allocation guidelines were created during the COVID um, surge. And this is like there are guidelines created by different countries, different states, different health, you know, medical societies, different health systems. Um, in the U.S., uh, we don't have any national ethical guidelines uh, for rationing scarce critical resources. Other countries do. Um, we do have them by state, um, and, and they vary by state. Uh, and I, go ahead. Okay, okay. Um, so I got to move quicker. So, um, and, and just, to, just to kind of start off with, I just wanted to also make the point that the, the role of these guidelines is to remove the responsibility from, from the position at the bedside. All right. Um, so, so this is, I'm going to talk about the New York um, State Ventilator Guidelines. I'm going to just skip that quote, if, just in the interest of time. Um, so the New York State Guidelines, um, it, they're really based on short-term prognosis. Um, and uh, so you, step one would be exclusion criteria um, if the, the patient, and this is just based on, um, you know, whether the patient is going to have immediate or near immediate mortality uh, regardless of um, of aggressive therapy. Um, and then the New York State Allocation Guideline uses the SOFA score, um, which we know is a, you know, a score that's not really used in the ED, it's used in the ICU to, to predict the likelihood of uh, mortality. Um, it's a score based on a degree of dysfunction for six organ systems. Um, and basically, they're, you know, patients with a SOFA score greater than 11 wouldn't be given an event, they're gonna likely um, have a poor outcome regardless. Um, and the category is people, you know, a SOFA score under seven are going to get the highest priority. Um, so, and in terms of like where age and comorbidities fit, um, you know, age and comorbidity does like affect the SOFA score, um, but it, uh, there is no there is no room for, for thinking about comorbidities outside of the actual, um, you know, clinical picture using the SOFA score, um, and age can only be used as a tiebreaker. Um, and then the idea of time trials is just to kind of reassess the SOFA score and uh, be able to withdraw therapy from patients if their SOFA score heads into that blue range that's greater than 11. All right. So I'm just, uh, Sophia? Yeah. I have 18 minutes online, but I know that it started late. Should I like You're good. go over yeah, the... Yeah, you can go over. Okay, because I'm yeah. like, just like trying to. No like, worry. I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're fine. I'll tell you. All right. So, hopefully, everyone got a chance to just read this. Was, emergency decisions are not removed from ethical evaluation, just their decisions. Um, so, you know, we, we made ethical decisions. Or, we, we didn't run out of events. The New York State guidelines didn't actually, like, you know, they. Uh, I, I failed to mention before that um, these were created in 2006 in New York State. And that was like in reaction to the 2005 um, influenza pandemic. But even when asked about, uh, you know, some type of guideline, Cuomo didn't even realize that there, there were guidelines um, and they were not put into place. Um, but because thankfully we didn't actually really run out of ventilators, but we were making these, these types of decisions. Um, and we make ethical decisions all the time in the ED. Um, so I just kind of wanted to provide a, a rapid ethical uh, or a framework which I didn't come up with. Um, this is a rapid ethical framework that can be used in the ED, and it's created by Kenneth Iserson, who's an ED um, physician and a bioethicist. Um, and this was created um, a, few, a couple of de decades ago, and um, he created it as a, to be used in, um, for providing care in low resource settings. Um, this is something we can apply you know, to our day-to-day -day decisions. Um, so, so step one, is this a type of ethical problem for which you have already worked out a rule, or is it at least similar enough so that the rule could reasonably be extended to cover. Um, and in order to actually be able to ever follow, you know, yes, uh, I think there, there is an importance in, in, in kind of having some, um, you know, prior, prior knowledge and, you know, familiarity with ethical, like common ethical discussions, um, kind of to just help us prepare for, for these moments when we're, you know, at the bedside, we're tired, um, you know, we, have, we all have our biases, um, how to make these decisions. Um, so no, 
Is there an option that will buy it in time for deliberation without excessive risk to patients? Um, so, you know, an example of that would be, you know, if you're deciding whether I should resusc whether you should resuscitate a patient when you're not you're not clear on, you know, their DNR or DNI. You might just decide to do non-invasive um, resuscitation while trying to figure out what the most ethical approach would be. Um, and then if that's a no, step three would be to apply the following test tests. And you can do that um, simply by asking yourself three three questions. So the impartiality test. Would I be willing to have my physician act in this manner if I were in the patient's place? Uh, the universality, I know it's going to mess that up, test. <laughs> uh, would I be comfortable if all physician clinicians with my background in, and in these same circumstances act in this manner? And the interpersonal justifiability test. Am I ready to state the reason for my proposed action openly to my peers, superiors, and public? Um, and I, if I had more time, I would like it would be great to go through a case. Um, I, I think I just tried to cover too much in this lecture, so I've got to move on. Um, so, last portion of my talk is just a, um, that last segment. Um, I, I asked everybody about, you know, should patients be able to purchase treatment priority? Um, basically, the overwhelming answer was no. Um, but we all know that, and then that's kind of like a just an overall, um, you know, uh, agreed upon um, idea in terms of. Uh, allocation of resources during a pandemic. Um, doctors, swap surfers, they all agree that um, the care a patient receives shouldn't be based on their wealth. On wealth. However, um, we know that our healthcare system is, is not really set up with that kind of principle in mind. Um, we know that, uh, so American law does not recognize legal right to receive healthcare. There's inequities across the board, locally, nationally, internationally. Um, and there's definitely tremendous inequities in resource allocation. In um, so just to go through this pretty quickly, um, you can read the, the graph that basically it just demonstrates that, you know, Manhattan um, has more beds per patient um, and had less COVID cases. Queens, where COVID hit really hard, 1.5 beds per 1,000 people, 22 COVID cases per 1,000 people. Um, that's tremendous, like, it's hard to think through that because considering the fact that in, um, in Queens, four safety net hospitals closed between 2003 and 2009. Um, and one of, one of the factors that contributes to the inequitable distribution of hospital beds is that they're, you know, uh, hospitals need to stay open. Um, where are they getting the money that they're, you know, for, for patients that are um, on Medicaid and uninsured? Um, there's federal disproportionate share of hospital payments which are supposed to be allocated to, to safety net hospitals. And in a lot of states, they're given directly to the, to the top 25% hospitals that care for the highest proportion of these patients. But in New York, those funds are spread across the board, um, so, which means that half of these funds are actually directed to the bottom 75%. So like these big academic centers that we know about in you know, NYU, New York Presbyterian, uh, they're, they're getting a significant amount of funds and they're clearly not treating the same number of patients um, as, you know, a safety net hospital system like health and hospitals. Um, and this kind of just, like, even uh, the disparities kind of increased during, during, uh, during COVID um, in terms of the allocation of resources. This is, uh, so the CARES Act was, um, you know, a, a federal stimulus act that was passed in the end of March, and it provided $150 billion um, for healthcare providers and hospitals. And um, it was determined that this, the funds would be allocated based on hospitals' um, history, past history of Medicare payments, um, which was definitely, um, you know, an inequitable uh, way to allocate funds. You know, we don't really see the, as many Medicare patients here as we do, you know, Medicaid and uninsured patients, um, especially compared to, you know, the larger academic hospitals. Um, so New York Presbyterian, it's, it's not just one hospital, it is also a hospital system. They got $119 million from the CARES Act, whereas New York Health and Hospitals, it's 11 hospitals, um, got 45 million. Um, and just to kind of have one example that really stood out to me, so so Schuler County, I, I, I don't know where that is, um, but it's it had 11 COVID cases um, at the time that these funds were allocated um, and received $4.6 million, so that's 426,000 case. And this is a wealthy, a wealthy county. Um, whereas in Queens County, where there had been over 60,000 COVID cases, they received 93 million. So that's, that's 1,500 cases. So again, 426,000 per case compared to 1,500 per case. 
So um, just takeaway points, um, fair resource allocation depends on a balance between maximizing benefit and treatment. Um, guidelines can help alleviate more moral burden and reduce bias. An ethical framework and some preparation can help us make rapid ethical decisions at the bedside. And um, of course, this pandemic has shed a greater light on inequities and the incredible need to advocate for more equitable allocation of resources. Um, and it's awesome to see our residency getting really involved with advocacy, both you know, at the bedside. And Any questions? Any Any questions? Mm -hmm. huh? So is this it's an amazing topic and, and very difficult topic? But so who who is? I mean, I saw Jill Barron, who everyone knows. She's the the SAM president. She was or she is. That uh, it's remember it's it's kind of our decision, and we have to be involved in the decision. But do we at on, on the front line uh, uh, in the trenches? Do we make the, the decisions or how do we advocate for our patients if something like this happens? Like so You're not talking about the like, just overall distribution of allocate. You're talking no, about like, I'm how not, do we- I'm, I'm talking yeah. about on the ground, one-on-one. -on -one. Let, let's say you have three patients waiting for ICU beds for three days or you know for, for hours or three days and then the rabbi shows up and gets a bed for his patient who haven't, hasn't even arrived at the hospital yet in less than an hour. Is this my responsibility to, to stand up and, and refuse that or try to change it? Or do we have anything in, in I, I don't know how to address this, the, these ethical questions when on the ground when they happen. Yeah. Um, so I, I think one, so the, like, you know, just in terms of like, an, I guess it would be easier for me to answer this question just in terms of ventilators, um, because because so there's ventilator allocation guidelines. So just know those guidelines um, would be helpful in just in making those decisions at the bedside, um, even regardless of whether they're actually enforced and the kind of like ethical considerations um, that go into those types of decisions. But generally, unless unless the state like mandates that this allocation guideline is going to be used across the board, it would be just in the clinician's, you know, it would be the clinician's decision um, to advocate for for the patients. Um, and, and and I think that's like the kind of the point of of having allocation guidelines. We saw in Italy when they were extremely scarce, there was no guideline that they were following, and it's I mean it's a tremendous amount of burden physicians to be deciding how to allocate research, scarce resources. Um, so that's why, why these guidelines are, are important. Um, and I think it's just useful to kind of know that there's a bunch out of there, out there, uh, you know, the Society of Critical Care Medicine has one. Um, there's a, one, like, you know, many, several countries in Europe have their own allocation guidelines and there are, there is some variability, but there's a lot that they share in common. What happens when allocation guidelines like don't agree. Like if a state has one and then a hospital system has a different one, or like the ones that are like ICU or different like how do you think you're <laughs> right? Right. So I mean in the United States we don't have a federal guideline. So if it came to the point in New York, it would be I mean, basically our New York state government deciding whether to to set forth these guidelines. Um, and and, it, and essentially, that would be like dependent how to to use the guidelines would be to depend on the hospital system. So some hospital systems would have people. I mean, that ideally, they would have a triage committee, triage officer that makes goes through these guidelines with each patient and makes those decisions. Um, but otherwise, it would just be a, a set of guidelines um, that clinicians would be aware of, you know, that we're following, and it would be kind of left to each physician to follow them. Yeah, that's the trigger thing, right? But if you don't even agree with the guidelines. Right, but if our department says these guidelines suck, so you always have to hopefully have that ability to still as a department as a physician to kind of make the right ethical decisions too, because in the end we're the ones who have to actually make the decisions. And, and it seems like you kind of always can discuss the case with, you know, clinician, like the examples that we've given you. The case is probably worth to discuss the ICU or between whoever is working at that time, it seems that it's nearly even a better, quicker answer than the guideline in a way. 
into this intellectual, more immediate, having a discussion about situation. Right, right. But just like back to uh, Stopshi's question, you know, it's like who's responsible for that? And I mean, if you if you were responsible for advocating for patients and making decisions, that's just this places a tremendous amount of burden on clinicians to make to make those decisions to have that kind of discussion every time. Um, but I think, but I think it's easy to make a decision once. Well, not easy. Hard to make a decision once. But in the setting of a surge, this might be a decision that you'd have to make every day or more than once a day. And if you had to sit there and analyze each individual case, I think you'd be, you'd come, you'd hit a brick wall. You wouldn't be able to do anything. You wouldn't be able to function um, and care for any of your patients if you're sitting there every day trying to decide who's going to live and who dies twice a day. We're, we're just not built for that. I mean, it's not, it's not, um, it's definitely not a safe way to practice. And, and, and it would be extraordinarily uh, burdensome from an ethical and cognitive standpoint. So I think having something that's already made a decision for you, it, it removes the cognitive load um, and and the emotional uh, load that comes with having to make that decision. It's very difficult. Right. And also removes some of the biases. I think you should be aware of the guidelines and know them and be comfortable with them before you get into the situation. I think that's kind of the point that uh, so I've been seeing people use guidelines. The way just kind of emotionally distancing himself from those decisions. Exactly. Okay, so this has been decided by someone above me, by my hand. Well, that's, I think we should work and protect you. Depending on how you use it. I was also curious though about like legal like revocation. Like I, I also know some other physicians use guidelines as a way of thinking they're protected legally, even though I don't think there's necessarily any real legal protection from having, you know, almost say this is our state guideline, someone at the hospital saying or like hospital guidelines like this. Yeah. Did you come across any Yeah, so that's that's the one of the benefits of having like not a saving their family member. Uh, yeah, so that's one of the benefit of having the New York State guidelines is that if you're following the guidelines and you end up getting you know sued for not putting for not putting a patient on the bench, it would be protected because that was the you know government like set set forth these guidelines. And these guidelines are created by like a huge task force. It includes like the New York Health Commissioner and a, a ton of different people you know that are um, that are in like committees. This isn't just kind of uh, so this, is, this if New York State had put forth this set of guidelines as we're following this, um, then it would it would protect it. In law. That was my understanding. Yeah, Monisha mentioned ASAP ethics committees apparently coming out with some policies for COVID. So I guess committees that are overseeing like our specialty are probably trying to do this at this time. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, great job. Yeah, yeah. hard luck. Thank you.